Well, here's the first video of Unit 4. This is uh, part of Lesson A. This is the first video of Lesson A. We're going to be covering what's called the Impulse Momentum Theorem. We'll start by defining impulse and momentum separately, and then we'll see how they combine in the Impulse Momentum Theorem. Our overall goal in this video is to be able to relate mass, velocity, and linear momentum for a single moving object. Now, so far, we've only considered forces of constant magnitude. When pushing a box across the floor, for example, we've considered the push to be a constant. Similarly, the pull of gravity on an object is a constant pull. But we know from our experiences that not all forces are constant. Oftentimes, forces change as they act on an object. Take a collision, for example, such as hitting a tennis ball or, or kicking a soccer ball. The force acting varies as it acts on the object. Also, the duration of the collision in these examples is very short, typically 1 to 10 milliseconds. A large force over a short time interval is called a, an impulsive force. Examples include hitting a baseball or the collisions that happen while playing pool. If we graph an impulsive force over time, we end up with a graph like this, where the force quickly reaches a peak and then drops. Even though we're looking for a short time interval, uh, we can see that an impulsive force is not constant. It changes while it acts. So if we were to graph the kick on a soccer ball, a harder kick will produce a taller graph, while a kick of longer duration will produce a wider graph. Now, a taller or wider force time graph has a larger area between the curve and the axis. So we can say that the effect of an impulsive force is proportional to the area under that force time curve. This area is called the impulse of the force. An impulse is given the symbol J. I know that, that totally makes sense that it would be given a symbol J, but that's, that's what it is. Now, impulsive forces can be sort of complex with the shape of the force time graph being complex as well. However, any graphs that we see will be simplified to be similar to this one here. Uh, from this graph, we can see that the area under the force time curve can be simply written as the average force times the time interval. And that's where we get our impulse equation, uh, which is equal, you know, impulse is equal to the force times the amount of time over which that force acts. And this, this force here is an average force. So impulse is a vector quantity that points in the direction of the average force vector. A positive impulse results from an average force acting in the positive direction, while a negative impulse is due to a force directed in the negative direction. Now another thing to look at where impulse is concerned is from this equation we can see that the units of impulse would be Newtons would be Newton seconds, okay? But since a Newton itself is a compound unit called a kilogram meter per second squared, we can show that this unit of Newton seconds can be simplified to kilogram meters per second. So that's the units we use for impulse, kilogram meters per second. So now let's shift to thinking about momentum. Momentum is a word we've all heard before and probably have an idea of what it is. We can all likely identify that a truck moving at 30 miles per hour has greater momentum than an identical truck moving at 15 miles per hour. What might be a little more difficult to identify is the fact that an aircraft carrier moving at a slow 2 miles per hour has way more momentum than our truck here, even if it's moving at 100 miles per hour. Now, that's because momentum is dependent upon both mass and velocity. In physics, momentum is defined as the product of mass and velocity. Momentum is represented by the symbol P, which I know, just like impulse, it totally makes sense to call momentum P, but it, it just is. So our equation for momentum is mass times velocity. 
So the faster an object moves, the more momentum it has. Similarly, the more mass an object has, the greater its momentum can be. That's why a slow-moving aircraft carrier has more momentum than a speeding truck. And finally, momentum has units then of kilogram meters per second, which we can see if mass is measured in kilograms, velocity meters per second, we have units of kilogram meters per second. Same units as impulse. That should indicate that there's some sort of connection between impulse and momentum. And that connection we call the impulse momentum theorem, which we'll look at next. So by analyzing the equations for impulse and momentum, it should be clear that they're connected. Both equations show that the units for both impulse and momentum are kilogram meters per second. But the question is just how are they connected? Today, we use F equals MA as a quick way uh, to define Newton's second law. But Newton himself did not express it in that way. Instead, he said that a force was the rate of change of momentum over time. So instead of F equals MA, he said that the force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the time interval over which the force acts. So if we multiply both sides of this by... Uh, the time interval, we get a change in momentum that is equal to the force times the time interval. Uh, this quantity, Ft, we recognize as impulse. So impulse is the applied force multiplied by the time over which it acts. This quantity is equal to the change in momentum of a system. So we can say that impulse is the change in momentum, and we call this the impulse momentum theorem. So then our equation for the impulse momentum theorem is this right here, where the impulse is equal to the change in momentum, which means we have a final momentum minus an initial momentum. The impulse momentum theorem then states that an impulse delivered to an object causes the object's momentum to change. So when you're putting a golf ball, for example, you deliver an impulse to the ball, changing its momentum. You can think of the putter as changing the ball's momentum by transferring momentum to it as an impulse. This way we say that a putter delivers an impulse to the ball, and the ball receives an impulse from the putter. Now, with both impulse and momentum being vectors, we can see that uh, direction is important uh, when we consider the impulse momentum theorem. So the soccer player in this picture here is a little bit more complicated of a case. Because both mo impulse and momentum are vectors, we can rewrite that impulse momentum theorem in terms of the x and y components. So here the x component of the impulse changes the x component of the momentum, so we have to look at the x component of the velocity in that case, and here the same thing for the y. So here the initial momentum of the ball is directed downward to the left. Uh, the impulse delivered to it by the player's head upward to the right is strong enough to reverse the ball's motion and send it off in a new direction. So then let's go ahead and take a look at an example. Here we got a ball of ma point, a mass to 0.25 kilograms and uh, it's rolling to the right. It strikes a wall. Uh, and rebounds to the left at 1.1 meters per second. Its initial velocity is 1.3. We want to know the change in the ball's momentum and the impulse delivered to it by the wall. Okay, so if we're looking for the change in momentum, that's just going to be our final momentum minus our initial momentum. Expression for momentum is mass times velocity. So we have MVF, that's for the final momentum, minus the initial momentum. We plug in our values, and we end up with a change in momentum of zero point, negative 0 0.6 kilogram meter per second. So the change in momentum here is negative, which just indicates that the ball bounces back off into the negative direction. And by the impulse momentum theorem, since the impulse is equal to the change in momentum, my impulse is also a negative 0 0.6 kilogram meters per second. An interesting application of the impulse momentum theorem is to the question of how to slow down a fast-moving object in the gentlest way possible. 
To answer this, we can look at two events, both involving a, say, a 1,200 kilogram car. So say we've got this car that's traveling at about 75 miles an hour on the interstate. Now that's about 125 kilometers an hour, or roughly 35 meters per second. We want to stop the car. That means that we're going to change the car's momentum. And that car's momentum, regardless of the way that we stop it, is going to change by 42,000 kilogram meter per second. Okay, so if we have a 1,200 kilogram car, we're going to bring it to a stop, so its velocity is zero. We're going to, from an initial velocity of 35 meters per second, we're going to get a change in momentum of 42,000 kilogram meters per second. Now, for this car, this will be the change in, no, in momentum no matter what. Now, let's bring in an impulse. If we use the brakes to come to a nice controlled stop, it's going to take a fairly long time to stop the car, probably about 12 seconds. But say, imagine we run into like a huge massive boulder that's rolled down on the mountain onto the roadway. The car will come to a stop in an extremely short amount of time, less than a second. We'll say it's 0.1 seconds. So now if impulse is equal to the change in momentum, we can use this to figure out what's going to happen with the forces involved in each of those stops. If we use the brakes to take a nice controlled stop, our, our impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So our average force times the time interval of 12 seconds ends up giving us a, an average force in this stop of 3,500 newtons. Okay. Over here, if we run into the boulder and say we come to a stop in about 0.1 seconds, that same change in momentum is going to give us an average force of 420,000 newtons. So in both cases, the car will have the same change in momentum, and it's also going to undergo the same impulse. The difference will be in the time and the force that it takes to stop the car. Using the brakes, the force acting on the car will be really small. Using the boulder, the force that acts on the car will be enormous. It's because of the impulse momentum theorem that things like padded baseball gloves and car airbags work. They each increase the amount of collision time, thereby reducing the amount of force experienced. Okay, so that'll end the uh, impulse momentum uh, component of lesson A. Uh, in our next video, video two, we'll talk about conservation of momentum and collisions. There are several uh, book problems that will be specific to the impulse momentum theorem, and we'll take a look at those in class. See you then.